This is the third video in a series on the 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene, which offers insightful lessons and historical examples of obtaining and wielding power. The book offers an amoral position on the potential uses of this power. In a world filled with chaos, we all naturally pursue control, and we gain that control through the use of power. While it is true that these laws can be used for our own selfish and possibly malicious benefit, there is also the possibility to use these lessons to guard against malicious power players and pursue benevolent goals. Throughout this series, I will describe each law of power while providing examples from popular film and television shows. Some of these depictions will have historical relevance, although fictionalized, but storytelling is merely just a reflection of the real world. These depictions are not meant to be taken 100% factually accurate, but as examples for you to learn the laws of power to use in your daily lives. Law 3. Conceal your intentions. Keep people off balance and in the dark by never revealing the purpose behind your actions. If they have no clue what you are up to, they cannot prepare a defense. Guide them far enough down the wrong path, envelop them in enough smoke, and by the time they realize your intentions, it will be too late. Robert Greene Transgression of the Law Part 1 In business dealings, it is often necessary to conceal your complete intentions in order to manage employee satisfaction within the company. If employees become aware of a planned shift in management strategy or the work environment, they will become more likely to decrease their productivity or pursue other offers of employment. In the third season of television series Mad Men, the advertising agency Sterling Cooper is sold to a British company looking to invest in the American market under the guise of diversification. If I might, I'd like to walk you through this slight reorganization. PPL London will be the head of this body, and Sterling Cooper now more than ever, our American presence. We help each other on both sides of the pond, whether it be sharing of creative genius, media savvy, or the unbridled acquisition of new business. In reality, their plan is to decrease overhead in order to increase their profits. It seems strange that the two of you went on the same overnight trip, and you put in for $70, and... He put in for 82. I signed his receipts, didn't I? Which brings us to the undocumented portion of my assessment. The amount of pencils, pens, pads, paper, and postage that are currently being consumed suit a company four times our size. We're very impressed, Lane. In nine months, you've trimmed every bit of excess, increased billings, and we haven't had a word of complaint. Very, very impressed indeed. And eventually sell off the company for additional profits. Oh, hello? Lane, Sterling Cooper is for sale. But why? We've reduced the staff and increased the revenue by 22%. I think you've answered your own question. When this plot is unwittingly leaked to the partners of Sterling Cooper, they stage a revolt. We know McCann Erickson bought PPL, and we know that makes Sterling Cooper chattel. Who told you that? Someone outside of this building, who knows? Well, they're wrong. Listen, I apologize, Lane. Obviously, the news is getting out. What news? PPL is being sold as well. What? Why wasn't I told? Didn't seem pertinent. Trying to keep our company calm as well as theirs. Well, where's my place in this? But we can, I suppose. You have absolute authority to fire anyone. Fire us. Fire us. Sever our contracts. Let us go. Nothing good ever came from seeking revenge. Nonsense. We'll make you a partner. I should think this is worth more than that. So we're negotiating. It could be done, but getting you, us, out of here isn't the difficult part. We need accounts. If I were to send a telex in at noon today that you've all been sacked, it's after close of business in London. It would remain unnoticed until Monday morning there, 2 a.m. here. That gives us today and the weekend to first gather accounts and then a skeleton staff to service them. Anyone approached must be a certainty. If news spreads, they'll lock us out. Working in secret, they handpick the best talents left in the agency and poach as many customers as possible. They're selling the company. Again? 
I'm starting a new agency. McCann bought PPL and us. Again? Pete, we're starting a new agency. Keep it to yourself, but I'm taking American Tobacco. We need another seven to ten million in billings. What do you have in your saddlebag so far? North American Aviation, Secor Laxatives, Gillette, Highlight, maybe Pampers. We'll make you a partner if you can deliver by Sunday. Sunday? By the time their parent company reveals its intention, most of Sterling Cooper's value had walked out the door. In business, the reveal of your intentions can lead to the loss of money. But in more primitive circumstances, the reveal of your intentions can lead to violent hostilities. In the 1972 Francis Ford Coppola film, The Godfather, based on the novel by Mario Puzo, the head of the Corleone crime family, Don Vito Corleone, played by Marlon Brando, is approached by the drug baron Salazzo to request the Don's investment and protection for building his drug empire. I need a man who has powerful friends. I need a million dollars in cash. I need Don Corleone, those politicians that you carry in your pocket, like so many nickels and dimes. The Don declines on moral and practical reasons. I must say no to you. And I'll give you my reason. It's true, I have a lot of friends, but they wouldn't be friendly very long if they knew my business was drugs instead of gambling, which they regard as a, a harmless vice. But drugs is a dirty business. I'm worried about security for your million, that the Italians will guarantee it. Oh, are you telling me that the Italians guarantee our investment? Wait a minute. During the meeting, the Don's son accidentally reveals that he is more amenable to the deal. I you on your new business, I know you do very well, and Good luck to you. Asbestos is your interests don't conflict with mine. After the meeting, the Don reprimands his son for revealing interest in the Tatalia's stake in the deal. Never tell anybody outside the family what you're thinking again. Salazzo is, of course, unhappy with the outcome, in which he also realizes that he's given away his intentions to bring more drugs and profit from the distribution into the Corleone-held community. Knowing this, the Don puts his men on alert and sends his trusted enforcer, Luca Brasi, to investigate the intentions of the Tatalia family, the Corleone's other rival. Luca Brasi poses as a free agent looking for possible work. However, knowing the Don's position on the future drug trade, the Tatalias and Salazzos aligned their interests in taking over the Corleone's protection business. With all the family's intentions out in the open, they move into hostile conflict. Seeing right through Luca Brasi's guise, they take the opportunity to take out the feared enforcer. And then they double down on their decision, taking the opportunity to assassinate Don Vito Corleone and kidnapping his conciliary, Hagen. I want you to help the Corleones, and I want you to help me. So now it's up to you to make the peace between me and Sonny. Sonny was hot for my deal, wasn't he? Because Sonny revealed his intentions in the meeting, Salazzo knows that he will perhaps get his deal if he is able to negotiate with Sonny instead of the Don. However, the Don survives. Part 2. Observance of the Law Continuing with thy example from The Godfather, the Tatalias then make a second attempt on Don Vito's life. What are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here now. I'm Michael Corleone. This is my father. There's nobody here. What happened to the guards? The police made them leave about ten minutes ago. But they are thwarted by Michael Corleone, played by Al Pacino. After the repeated failure to kill the head of the Corleone family, Salazzo requests a meeting with Michael to negotiate a possible peace. They chose Michael because he was smart enough to thwart the second attack, but was also weak enough to be beaten by the corrupt police officer McCluskey, and believed that Michael would be the better brother to negotiate with in good faith. I'm glad you came, Mike. I hope we can straighten everything out. Sorry about the other night, Mike. I gotta frisk you, so turn around, huh? On your knees, facing me. Oh, it is. He's clean. Knowing this, Michael attends the meeting, feigning interest in creating a peace between the families. All I want is a truce. I have to go to the bathroom. But with the intention of retaliation. Oh. 
This would become a standard move for Michael Corleone when he rises to the head of the family by the end of the film and has a series of meetings to signal that he is relinquishing control of his New York territory. Good now that they're going to solve all your problems and answer all your questions. Carlo, you grew up in Nevada. When we make our move there, you're going to be my right-hand man. It'll be a big factor in drawing gamblers at the casino. And we hope you'll sign a contract to appear five times a year. Sure, Mike. I'll do anything for my godfather, you know that. And taking over Las Vegas casinos in the possession of Mo Green. The casino. The hotel. Corleone family wants to buy you out. What do you think is going on here? You think you can come to my hotel and take over? The Coyote family don't even have that kind of muscle anymore. The Godfather is sick, right? You're getting chased out of New York by Bazzini and the other families. In reality, this is a feint. First, to put his enemies in New York off their defenses and to draw out traitors within his own inner circle. Keys to power. Plan ahead. Michael Corleone is a great strategist because he was always thinking ahead of his enemies. Bazzini won't move against you first. He'll set up a meeting with someone that you absolutely trust, guaranteeing your safety. And at that meeting, you'll be assassinated. He always knows what his enemies want, and that gives him insight into what they will do next. He often allows that to happen. Bazzini wants to arrange a meeting. He says we can straighten any of our problems out. You talk to him? Yeah. I can arrange security. On my territory. So that he can enact his own plan to get what he wants without anyone ever knowing what he was after all along. Create a smokescreen. In the second season of the TV series Better Call Saul, we follow the exploits of the ambulance chasing attorney Jimmy McGill and his early life as a cheap con man. A reminder that the con in con man comes from the word confident. Bro, I never did catch your name. Saul. <clears throat> Saul? It's all good, man. <laughs> Which Jimmy has in spades when pulling off his schemes. Check it out. What is that? Holy shit. There's got to be at least a thousand bucks in here, man. The signature move of Jimmy, or Saul, is the smokescreen. He always employs several layers of a scam to confuse the Mark as to his true intentions. In this particular scam, we see him lead a drunken Mark to the alley where he finds a friend who is pretending to be drunk and passed out. I'll kick you right in your stupid heads. I'll go John Claude dead damn on you. The Mark initially takes the man's wallet, looking for quick cash. I'm keeping the money. <laughs> Here you go, fatty. I got dibs on that watch, man. I don't see that. Jimmy, however, turns his attention to the man's wristwatch. Now the mark is confused, which is worth more, the wallet and the watch. So, how you want to split this up? I'll tell you what, you keep the cash, I'll just keep the watch. Well, it's worth like three grand. That's when Saul gets what he was really after the whole time. The money that was in the mark's wallet. I sweeten the pot. You got a five, 20, 40, 60, 80, 580 bucks. Add that to the thousand, it's more than half. The wallet, the watch were just smoke screens. So that by the time Jimmy asks the man for the money he has in his own wallet, he's so far down into the scam, it seems like small potatoes to the other items that are in play. Employ red herrings. In the 2003 film Runaway Jury, an adaptation of a John Grisham novel, we follow Nick Easter, played by John Cusack, as he manipulates the judge and the attorneys in a major lawsuit. Exercise her right to a jury trial. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now ready to begin the voir dire. In order to gain a seat on the jury and ultimately influence the outcome of the verdict. Nicholas Easter. Mr. Easter. Well, it says here that you worked in an electronics store. How would you feel if you knew there was a gun behind the counter in case of a robbery? Well, we're in the malls. The robberies take place in malls, aren't they? Yes, but we're in the Esplanade Mall, which is right across the street from the sheriff's office in Jefferson Parish. Well, I mean, you have to be on crack to try to rob him. I guess that's my point. What do you add, class clown, to Mr. Easter's ever-expanding resume? In order to gain his seat on the jury, he needs to hide his true intention. You might be inclined to excuse me for... Your situation, Mr. Easter? Yes, Your Honor. He does, though, by throwing out multiple red herrings. The Madden Challenge. The Madden what? You know Madden football? 
It's a video game. Well, you'd be surprised at how many people play. Every year they choose the best 15 players from across the country to compete in a kind of tournament, you know, against NFL players and celebrities. And it's a I'd big like deal. Not that this is a big deal. Civic responsibility. Do you have any objection to that, Mr. We are time. The I jury wanna... system was originated, Mr. Easter, because for thousands of years before that, an individual judge had the power to hang, for example, any young man he simply did not like. First, telling the judge that he would rather compete in a video game competition than serve in the trial. Later, he employs a smokescreen, knowing that the well-funded defendant attorney team would figure out what Nick was doing. He convinces them that Nick is able to deliver either verdict to the highest bidder. The defendants, knowing that the other side will never be able to meet the steep price, allow the trial to continue with Nick present without going into a mistrial. Neither of us wants a mistrial, no. Can we walk? Business, politics, sports, you tell me what isn't rigged. I mean, is there even such a thing as an objective jury, Mr. Fitch? Not if I can help it. Then why should the lawyers and guys like you make all the profit? By disguising his intentions, he is also able to use the negotiation to find out information about the other planted jurors. But tell me, who have you got? Fernandez, DeShazo, Grimes, and Dupree are in the back. Mm. Deets and Dukes pretty much follow the others. Herrera and Shaver are wild cards. No, uh, Shaver's taken care of. Weiss, too. Oh. Are you going to swing this my way? If you pay? Yes, I will. Good, good. The Reversal Once you've pulled a few tricks, you'll become known to your friends and enemies as an untrustworthy actor. Tell me, Mr. Varnum, does it bother you that everything you're selling is fake? Do these smiles seem fake? So you are a philanthropist? Ah, oh, hyperbole isn't the worst crime. Men suffer more from imagining too little than too much. The creed of a true fraud. People will always come to expect the unexpected and not trust your outward intentions as genuine. This, however, can be an asset as well. Because of this new reputation, people will look to you as somebody who can promise the impossible and deliver the possible. If and when the time comes, when you need to accomplish the impossible, you will be glad there are a few pirates and tricksters on your side to assist you. Me, I'm dishonest. And a dishonest man you can always trust to be dishonest. Honestly, it's the honest ones you want to watch out for. Because you can never predict they're going to do something incredibly stupid. If you would like a chance to own The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene, I am giving out a free copy of the book. All you have to do to enter is subscribe to the channel, like the video, and leave a comment down below. The winner from the last drawing is on screen right now. Please contact me at The Lazy Stoic across all social media. As always, this has been a production of Minimum Effort Media. There are new videos here on the first Friday of every month. Please like, share, and comment if you care to. Thanks for watching.